Um, so I'm Meg Ford. Um, I worked on the hack project for about six months during uh, the phase of the project that we're going to talk about today. Um, and I've been in the GNOME community for, it's like eight years now, so. Hi, I am Manuel Quinones. I am actually working at the uh, hack project at Endless. And yes, so we are going to talk about this project um, and share the details, uh, I mean the technical details um, of um, this is a learning experience for young learners uh, that want to learn how to code. And uh, are going to share a video first. From uh, here. So this is the first boot experience. Uh, uh, the sounds goes to HDMI, so it's not playing the sound. Um, yeah, the first boot experience is, um, is this uh, puzzle you have to sort out to actually enter the experience. And so when you start uh, the OS, there, there are these characters that guide you and help you to sort the, this puzzle. For that, you have to hack the application. And to that, you flip the a window, the characters give you hints, and it's better with, with sounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, the hub project is on top of Endless OS, uh, which in turn is on top of GNOME. And it's, it's an experience embedded in, in the wall system, uh, in the wall operating system. So for that, we have uh, custom applications and customizations in, applied to the OS. This transition is actually software. It was a problem with the uh, screen capturing. But you sort out the puzzle and then you land in the desktop and this character welcomes you and this is the side panel where you can meet the characters and find more quests and follow the story. So yeah, I think, yeah, I, let's go back to the presentation. So um, the, the, when I worked on Hack, the, the team that we had at that time was a pretty um, diverse team. We had, uh, we, because we were doing so, so much design as well as application development, um, and because the Hack applications were actually games, we had a diverse group of people working together. So we had uh, the UX designers who uh, designed the actual widgets um, the GTK widgets. Um, we had game designers who designed the actual games that the kids interacted with in order to uh, learn the, le the coding lessons. We had a sound designer who designed all the sounds that you did not just hear. Um, we, we had the game developers who actually uh, coded the, the hack toy apps. Um, project manager, QA, the leadership team, um, and we had kids who came to the office to do play testing for us. So one of the fun things about the job was getting to see kids interacting with the games. Uh, mostly the people in San Francisco got to see that, but I got to sit in once while people did that, and it was a pretty cool to see the kids enjoying stuff. So, and we had the sales and support team. Yes. So this experience, as we said, is spread. In the operating system, there are different 
is composed of different modules. And uh, th this talk is about sharing technical details of some of these uh, components, uh, in particular the, the ones we were involved, Meg and I were involved. In particular, I, I will talk about the side panel, um, and Meg will talk mainly about the toolbox, which is the uh, part that is behind the application when, when you flip it. But there are other components. Uh, we have um, custom system notifications. The, the characters, the, the pop-up dialogues are actually uh, system of notifications, like when, for example, um, you get an email or a calendar uh, note notification. Uh, but these are customized with animations and sounds and uh, the, the style, the unique style we, we had. And there's a sound server uh, where all the different components can uh, play sounds. The, there is a game state service uh, that holds the, the state of the game. And the different components can read and, and, and also write and uh, wait for changes in, in this service. Uh, there's the quest system that our uh, quest uh, scripters um, uh, had uh, to, to write the different quests that the characters provide. Um, and other shell customizations. And there are also tools uh, to expose the um, methods and values from the hackable application. So then the characters can see if, uh, for instance, you change the code of uh, of an, an app to, in order to hack it and uh, different things. So again, I, I will talk about the side panel. Uh, we call it the clubhouse because it's called the clubhouse in, in the narrative. And this is where the characters live and they provide, this, this is the entry point uh, to the narrative. And the, the first thing that the characters say is that uh, you can find them there. Um, th there is a button in the desktop uh, that you can click it in order to open it and close it. And um, users can also be attracted by pulsating that button. That button is pulsated um, in different uh, cases when, when we want to attract users to that place. And as you can see, um, the Clubhouse is implemented as a GTK application. By the way, I forgot to say that there, there are going to be code snippets uh, in the, so if you are vis visually impaired like me, there are uh, seats, uh, close, empty seats close to the, to, to the projector. So it's a GTK, it's a normal application written in GTK, uh, just uh, presented in a, a special way by the shell, by GNOME shell. So for that we had uh, customizations in GNOME shell because we um, kind of own the, um, because we are based on endless OS, we can do these customizations and discuss them with our platform team. And the GTK application uh, is, in this, uh, the, the models decided, uh, each model owner this decided to write them in different ways. Uh, in this case, is using the Python bindings, uh, using the G object introspection, and uh, each of the models, and this is the same, are uh, distributed as flat packs and communicate using DBAS mainly, and also through the game state that we'll see later. And this application is also in, in charge of uh, running the quest system because, uh, well, for 
implementation reasons it could be another app, but we had it like this. And uh, about the, pro the process life cycle, um, because this is a side panel, um, we uh, stop the application after a timeout. I th yeah, uh, five minutes timeout. And for that, we use the uh, GIO application inactivity timeout. But when we run Quest, and Quest can be in the background, maybe the player is uh, doing something else in another ap application because it's a multitask des desktop. So we use CIO application hold and release while the uh, quests are running. And I wanted to talk about the um, character animations uh, that we did. So back to the previous slide. Uh, these characters are actually uh, GTK buttons with GTK image inside, nothing special. Um, so we extended the GTK image to um, have multiple animations in, in each of the buttons. And we um, made a, a Python class uh, extending GTK image. Um, and the format is a PNG file that contains all the frames. You can see the artwork is traditional animation 2D. And there is a metadata file, a JSON file, that explains, uh, that describes these animations. So uh, this is how it looks. Um, you have uh, the JSON file that, uh, where you can reuse frames, set different uh, delays for these frames, and also random delays because otherwise the characters will uh, move uh, at the same time. So, um, this is the main loop of the animation uh, in CTK. You can, um, like in other, like in game engines or uh, in web, you can synchronize a method with the uh, frame uh, with, with the frame rate of the output device. So in order to do that, um, you can see here the step method of the animation system class is uh, connected in the application with the add tick callback that she uh, that. Uh, every widget has, and that step method will be called uh, every time uh, the screen needs to be refreshed. And inside that, we can see, uh, we can check if the animation has to be updated according to the times set in, in this uh, metadata, and if so, if, if they need, we call advanced frame and update image in the animations. Uh, this is how we extended the GTK image. There's a class extending it uh, that loads the animations and place one at a time using the animation system. Um, there's nothing special here. Uh, this is like a bag of animations um, because what changes the pixels is actually the animation instantiated here. You can see the image is passed as a parameter. So the animations uh, have a target animation image, which the, the one which has passed it. And they load the PNG uh, that contains all the frames. And we create a sub-pixel buffers, uh, GDK pixel buff for each frame. 
So in, this is how uh, you reuse memory instead of loading one frame uh, at a time. So, uh, so the sub pixel buff are like slices of the main pixel buff that share the pixel information. And this is how it loads. I don't want to uh, go into that many details, but and yeah, you can see how uh, the update image is made here in this code. And this is what the animation system uh, calls um, when, when it needs to be updated, when the image needs to be updated. So we have different animations for the characters, uh, usually an idle animation and also a highlight animation uh, when they want to attract the user attention. And there are also special animations for different uh, parts of the narrative. About the dialogue implementation, they were actually two implementations, one uh, in the shell and one inside the, uh, there are dialogues that appear inside the CDK application. Um, and so they look similar, but they were implemented in uh, different uh, technologies. The shell uh, notification is uh, clutter and the app one is using GTK. And so uh, we have to maintain the, the two, um, um, the, the, yeah, maintaining this is a, a bit difficult, but uh, when, we ha when we have that in place, uh, it worked. So for the shell, there is something similar that what we did with Pix buffers. Um, there is already uh, animation class in the shell. We extended that. That was a customization we did, and it does the same uh, reuse, but with um, with textures because uh, the shell has uses clutter. Uh, so every element is a clutter actor. And of course the CSS was different uh, because the structure of the um, of, of, of the message was were different. So you can see here a uh, GIF animation I did with the screenshots while um, working and try, trying to match the two implementations. Um, you can see the commits passing by. And yeah, it was hard, but uh, and you had to um, think about the limits. For, for instance, in Clutter, you can animate everything and rotate everything. And, but and if the designers want that, um, you can do that in the shell, but not in, in CDK. So you have to come with uh, the best of the two worlds, so to say. So about the quest scripting, these are intended to be simple, like simple Python scripts that a developer can, a quest developer, can create using a simple API. And the idea here is that um, they extend the quest class and create, a, define a step begin. I hope you can see, can you see the code? Otherwise I can tell you. Um, so they define a first step which is called step begin that's mandatory, and the steps have to return other steps. And that's how uh, they create the flow uh, of the quest, uh, like you can see in the diagram below. 
And um, the dialogues were um, actually authored in a spreadsheet. So um, the quest scripters can write raw dialogue and then a writer can come and write them better. And so we have tools to import the dialogues. So uh, that's why in the code they are referred uh, by, yeah, by message IDs. So this flow describes basically uh, a quest that, that was a common flow uh, to begin a quest asking the player to launch an application, to hack it, and then ask them to flip the application, change the code, and flip it back, and play it. And then the quest will check if the uh, player uh, sorted out the, the puzzle or did the change uh, to, to make the su succeed state happen. And then it, it congratulates the player and the quest ends. Um, the, the ones with the asterisks are because uh, we also had a, it's a Python decorator to uh, check if the application is launched. We had a special step that was abort. And so in, if in any of those steps the player closed the app, the abort step is executed. So um, the quest scripters had uh, access to this API to display dialogues and hint the user, uh, wait for dialogue confirmation, uh, which of the buttons was clicked in, in a dialogue. Um, they could check if a uh, uh, property has changed and they can also wait for a change in the application. So, uh, for instance, if the application was flipped. And also monitor if the app is running, like I said, play sounds, etc. So for the quest scripting, we had to integrate with Python async IO. Um, why? Because we wanted, uh, again, we wanted these scripts to be, to be simple for, for writing. And in GTK, you can uh, create callbacks to the um, divas uh, methods we, we had, but that will be uh, hard for, for a quest scripter. So instead, we, we wanted to use uh, asynchronous, like uh, blocking on, on an asynchronous call, and then continue the execution of the quest. Because <laughs> quest scripters had initially started creating while loops like, with uh, like the one you see there, like slip for a fragment of seconds and then continue. And this actually gives them a better uh, flow control because if you see the first snippet, it's uh, the first line is wait confirm, it's waiting for a dialogue confirmation. And the second line is waiting for a property change. And in the um, snippet in the middle, uh, they can wait for one or both to happen and then decide what to do. So they can uh, connect to a message, uh, confirm, to a confirmed message and connect to a property change and then wait for one of both. And if you see the uh, blocking ones at the bottom, they are actually implemented like this in the code they are um, actually using the connect methods and, and waiting for them, doing a busy wait. So, 
So uh, that's why we uh, integrated with Python async IO. Uh, this is how. Um, Python async IO was integrated with the glib main loop, uh, with, with the event loop, I mean, using a um, glib goto that we found in GitHub. And um, yeah, it's, it's very simple. It's doing the work very well. Um, the connect methods are connect, uh, they are connected to different callbacks and return a class we wrote that's called as async action. And the callbacks are in charge of either resolving or canceling uh, these async actions. And the async actions have state like uh, don't cancel it, pending or unknown. So if you see this is a uh, reduced imp uh, implementation of the connect a property change, uh, I reduced it to, to fit uh, in, in this slide. But you see um, it has a callback and it, it's in charge of resolving the asynchronous action. And it returns the asynchronous action to, to, the, to the quest. So um, that app.connect props change is uh, actually waiting for, you, is using that uh, Divas interface that device method you see below. So these are my personal pro pros and cons of the implementation decisions. Uh, I think uh, using GTK was a bit limiting, but it was uh, stable because, for instance, uh, other models we had, uh, like the, the game applications, are uh, wrappers. They are CTK applications with a, a, um, what's the name? Uh, with, with a browser, and it's mainly a JavaScript application inside. So it's web technology, and the designers thought, um, for instance. Uh, it was difficult to implement things like um, spawning particles in in the clubhouse, but I think it, it was a good decision to use GTK for this. And about PyG object, uh, it's not yet integrated with Python async IO, which is by default in Python three, and so maybe using GJS will have been a better idea for for this model. Okay, and now Meg will talk about the toolbox. Okay, so uh, the toolbox is uh, the toolbox is basically it's a single application um, that uh, provides the flip to hack functionality, which um, people may be familiar with because there were talks in previous Guadix, um about flip to hack and the whole concept of flipping the GTK application and making the code available to hack. Um, so the toolbox is an application that owns all of the various toolboxes for the, uh, for the toy app applications. Um, so the, the toolbox application opens and closes those toolbox windows um, at the appropriate time, and it feels like it's part of the toy app so it's integrated in terms of style, um, and it allows you to interact with the application through code and widgets. So these are the components of the toolbox. Um, the way that we organized the, the toolbox is uh, the, the organization method is called a topic. So the topic button, when you click on the topic button, such as that one that says game, um, then the UI components related to the topic appear, and then also a 
sometimes there will be a code view that allows the kids to actually um, change parameters in the code and those are sent back to the game. Um, so the control panel is what we call the UI portion of the, of the widgets and then the code view is our name for the, uh, the code that the kids can interact with. So another um, responsibility of the toolbox is as the user progresses in a quest, we hide or show various elements of the toolbox. So um, in the beginning, when a kid would flip uh, one, of the, one of the games, they would see the toolbox lock screen which basically closes off the entire toolbox and makes it so that the kid would have to, the only way that they have to interact with the toy app is actually through playing the game. Um, at a certain point, they solve some riddles or learn something and, and then they get a key which they can use to open that initial toolbox lock screen. We have some finer grained controls um, as well so we, Sometimes we might want to show one of the topics, but not the other topics that are available in a given toolbox. So we have a few different ways that we were doing that. Um, we have the topic button, which makes it so that you can't actually select a topic. It covers the topic, and then when you get the key, you can click on it, and then the, the toolbox button, the topic button opens up, and you can see all of the UI elements. We have the topic lock screen, which is a way where you can select the topic, but all you would see is a lock screen covering the topic information. And then we have partial topic lock screens. So the implementation is uh, similar to the Clubhouse, but we're using uh, GJS. Um, so it's GJS and GTK. It's distributed via Flatpak. And we're using Glade files for the UI. And, um, the communication over Clippy and DMBUS. So the way that the flip to hack functionality works is it's actually an action that's exported on DBUS and pressing the flip to hack button activates that action. And then GNOME shell uh, matches the toolbox window in the, to like the specific window in the toolbox application to the hack app window and then executes that flipping animation. Um, so within the code, the control panel widgets are represented as uh, G object properties. So when the user changes values, um, the, for example, the size of the astronaut in the game, uh, we would validate that the value is uh, within a certain range and then if that passes validation, then we would send that information uh, via Clippy over to the toy, bot, the toy app application. And then when the user flipped the application back to play the game, those parameters would be changed and they would have kind of instant feedback about the, you know, the, the results of their actions. Um, so within the topic, there were like, two different scopes of objects. So sometimes you may change something and uh, it would be set globally for all of the different levels in the game for the, of the toy app or it might be set scoped per level. Um, so Clippy will listen to changes for the properties in the toy app and sync them back to the toolbox, especially in the case that if you move from one level to another, um, and you've set a, a parameter in the toolbox, um, it might be reset by the game, and uh, it also syncs those properties from the toolbox to the toy app. <clears throat> so the code view, um, the code is actually sent like as a string um, between the toy app and the toolbox. And the toolbox, one of the, the important functions of the toolbox is to do some validation of the code so that we can give uh, useful feedback to the user about their changes. Oh, can you actually play the video? And we're gonna 
can we try to play with sounds? Maybe. So it would be something like the sound. Um, Minute fifty So, um, there we go. So, as you could see, um, that was actually the, the game, the, the rally game. I forget what, I think the, in the end we named that game Sidetrack, but it's a, for a lot of the time we called it the Riley Maze. Um, and Riley is one of the characters in the clubhouse. Um, and at one point, Riley gets trapped, and you have to complete a bunch of levels to to release Riley from the trap. Um, so what you saw there was um, the, uh, we sent actually incorrect code over as a challenge for the kids to try to solve. Um, and the way that, what we ran into is that it was difficult, JavaScript doesn't have a lot of stuff like built-in type checking. And so we ended up having to uh, implement a lot of stuff in order to try and give useful feedback to the kids. Um, so one of the things that we ended up doing was using um, proxy objects. Um, so you can see here, there's the, there's the Riley object, and the Riley object has a queue of instructions, and then various instructions like forward, up, down, jump, and push. Um, and what we did was uh, we would get, if the kids coded the instructions incorrectly, they would get pretty generic error. And so one thing that we did was use the proxy method, I mean the proxy object, to override the get method um, on the Riley object. And uh, proxy objects in, in uh, JavaScript, they allow you to, to like, override like fundamental uh, properties of the object. So here we overrode the get method and in order to basically give this specific type of error that we called an instruction error where we could give the kids better feedback about what was wrong with the code. So in most cases, we would evaluate the user function and check for errors, and if there are errors, then we would not send that code back to the toy app. But in the case of the Riley maze, we actually showed, as you saw, you may have noticed that one of the instructions showed up as like an exclamation mark in the beginning, in that clip that we just showed, and that's because we had a glitched instruction. Um, so one of the nice things about the Riley code was, the Riley maze was that, the kids could actually send over incorrect code and get feedback about which instruction was wrong, and they could play through the game in that way. Um, so here you can see um, when we did the ch when we check the user function, we use this compile function, compile method, and um, usually we would only send the information back to the application after we checked and made sure that there were no actual errors and set that needs attention indicator to false. Um, however, in the case of the Riley maze, we would actually check and see if it was an, if the error was an instance of the instruction error, um, we would actually send, allow that code to be sent back to the application and the application would interpret that 
incorrect instruction as a glitched instruction and let the kid play through. Um, so uh, another aspect of the club of the toolbox was um, the lock screens. And the way the lock screens were implemented is uh, the clubhouse would tell the game state service what the state of all of the applications and all of the lock screens were. Um, so the game state is, uh, the clubhouse can write to the game state service and uh, read from the game state service and so can the toolbox. So the toolbox on startup would read from the game state service and figure out what level all of the kids were on, the kid was on in all the different various games and um, also the state of things like the lock screen. So that's where we would get the information about which code to show um, as well as uh, whether a lock screen state was locked or unlocked. Um, if we had an unlocked lock screen, we would allow the kids to click on it, play the open animation, and then uh, we would sync that variable back to the game state and the game state would keep track of it so that the next time the toolbox started up, the lock screen would be open for that topic. Um, so another thing that we implemented in order to allow for more fine-grained control of the toolbox was actually a, we have a simple dbus server. Um, and that's used by the clubhouse to communicate directly with the toolbox. So the way that that works is um, if, the, if for a certain part of a quest, we want to make a topic that was previously available, um, unavailable, or change the state of something, then we provide methods um, and, uh, and ways for the, the clubhouse to actually directly manipulate the interaction. So in this case, um, one of the reasons why I decided to show this was actually, I think when we were working on this on the client and server side, it was actually fairly difficult to find um, uh, GJS uh, examples of dbus methods. And uh, so I thought it was actually a pretty nice example because we have uh, the method, we have a uh, a property and then we also have a signal implemented. So it's just a kind of a nice example that gives you a lot of a lot of information about how to write a little dbus server. Um, so here I just am showing you a little bit about how the revealed method was implemented. So the what when the toolbox for a certain application is created, um, we add the various topics to that toolbox, and each topic uh, exports a Dbus, uh, an object on Dbus. So each topic is represented as an object on Dbus. Um, so within the topic button, we have uh, we register, and then whew, that's the wrong side, and then uh, the Revealed method is, is a, a G object property. Um, so here the dbus implementation will set the revealed property and then the toolbox actually listens, it connects on the notify signal for the, for the revealed property. And I keep doing that, oops. Um, and then it either shows or hides that topic based on uh, what the, the information that's sent over Dbus. So that's pretty much all I had to say. Yeah, and at last we want to share a uh, bit more details about the different uh, models that we haven't covered in detail and we won't, <laughs> uh, but in general uh, the servers uh, had no user facing, um, weren't user facing, they, they didn't have graphical interfaces, but they were also flat packs. Um, for instance, the Hackson server uh, can play um, uh, effects, sounds, and also background sounds 
the background sounds uh, is a particular sound that can uh, happen one, one at a time. Um, and it was uh, similar to the character animations. We had uh, the asset and the metadata that described the asset. Um, so, and, and the different components can uh, call by divas, can call play sound, play this sound given a sound ID. <laughs> And so you can see here the description of a particular sound that has uh, the sound file. Um, if it loops, if, if it fades in, fade, fades out, uh, you can adjust the volume, the pitch, and um, also have a delay. And the overlap behavior is interesting uh, because uh, it describes what happens when the client, I mean the other models, play this sound repeatedly um, and the sound is still playing. Um, the options are uh, to restart the sound, so uh, the sound is playing and the, a new call uh, arrives and so the server restarts the sound or overlaps it is another option so you can hear the sound uh, multiple times, uh, if you, for instance, click, click, click on, on, on a button, or the other behavior was to just is ignore um, the call. And uh, at the bottom you can see how you can play a sound using the command line. Uh, just an example, just using uh, the boss call. And, yeah. Okay, so, uh then the game state service is basically uh, for anyone who's done game development, I'm sure, or even probably played games, you're familiar with a save file. So the, the game state service is basically the service that writes to and reads from that, that uh, save file and provides the information from the save file to the various applications. Um, so it keeps track of the user's uh, progress in the individual quests and um, then syncs all of that information out to the, the applications as they need them. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah. Yeah, uh, do we have time for questions? No. Yes, we do? Okay, so thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, No? Okay, then, thank you very much. Let's uh, give an applause to the speakers. Yeah. <laughs>